Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lydia Calipoliti. I'm an architect, an engineer, and a scholar. And uh, my research focuses on the intersection of architecture, technology, and environmental politics. Um, I'm currently an assistant professor of architecture at the Cooper Union in New York. And um, I'm the author of the book, The Architecture of Closed Worlds, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit um, throughout my talk. And I'm really happy to be here with you today uh, to share some rough thoughts on uh, the very general theme of the climate crisis related to mostly self-sufficient systems and the recycling of waste and organic excrement. So the title of my talk, I've tentatively titled it um, A Manifesto Against um, Extinction, A Manifesto on Shit. And uh, this is also related to the subtitle of my book, uh, The Architecture of Closed Worlds, or What is the Power of Shit? And I'm going to start with the thought um, on revising or reviewing the work of Bruno Latour in 2017 um, in his book, Down to Earth, where he made the claim that climate change, social inequality, and economic deregulation are connected and inseparable problems. And he envisioned the materialization of these three factors as a kind of landing process parachuting down to earth. Arguably, we are among this kind of landing today. In the aftermath of the pandemic, the world of neoliberal governmentality and ethics hopefully seems to be waning, enduring our state of connected immobility for those of us, of course, that were lucky to be in this state. We were called to reflect on the fragility of our production processes, the hubris for ceaseless growth and endless mobility, and finally, our accountability for how we occupy our planet. Although there is very little concrete evidence that directly links COVID-19 to the environmental degradation of natural habitats, the privileged logic of unaffectedness that has propped up such acts of ignorant denial has been severely damaged. In our world, there is no place of escape. The age of extinction is also a telling blow to the denial of climate change in a broader sense as a material condition that impacts all human and non-human beings. In light of this sense of general endangerment, it becomes manifest that in the greater planetary scale, we are the expandable ones, not the earth. As you see it wounded, in the image in the screen. Borders loom as the weakened fantasies of nation states to withhold sovereignty, a sovereignty that is in many ways detached from the water and the air that we breathe and drink as subjects and from the materiality of their bodies, of our bodies in how we encounter the physical world. Today, therefore, it is inevitable to explore the role of architecture, social dynamics, and environmental thinking within the context of these interconnected global crises, the climate emergency, social inequity, and the depletion of natural resources. To think very deeply, hopefully, of how architecture constructs, distributes, and leverages power, as well as how spaces are shaped by larger political agendas that unequivocally involve questions of race, gender, materiality, and biopolitics. In questioning how might we claim such a responsibility, I would like to offer a few thoughts as a response, particularly relating to the urgency of the climate crises. To be more precise, on the ways in which we construct narratives to understand, process, and reflect on environmental problems. And I will start by discussing the theme on waste, excrement, and what I have called in the subtitle of my book, The Power of Shit, offset from the book, The Architecture of Closed Worlds that I have authored and was published by Lars Muller Publishers in 2018. In this book, the objective was to rewrite the history of 20th century architecture, design and engineering via the conceptualization and production of spaces as closed systems. I have argued in a few words that contemporary discussions about global warming, recycling and sustainability have emerged as direct conceptual constructs related to the study and analysis of closed systems. 
from the space program to countercultural architectural groups experimenting with autonomous living, closed worlds documented a disciplinary transformation and the rise of a new environmental consensus in the form of a synthetic naturalism, where basically the laws of nature and metabolism have been displaced from what we used to call wilderness to the domain of cities and urban environments. While these ideas derive from a deeply rooted fantasy of architecture, of an architecture that produces nature, closed roles was dis has displayed their integration into the very fabric of reality in our contemporary cities and buildings. So the title of the book, which you see on the screen, references a very famous book of 1969, Rainer Banham's book, The Architecture of the Well-Timbered Environment but it was in good company with a much uglier subtitle, What is the Power of Shit? And that was entirely intentional because what I've argued was to write a counter history to the idealization of circular economies. We really need to look at excrement and to be blunt at shit because it surrounds our existence in more ways that we want to observe and acknowledge. The idea of a world where all of our resources are recirculated and never wasted, although it is very comforting, defies quite a few intricacies that are present both in environmental science as well as in design thinking. Moreover, it dwells on a kind of wishful thinking and the idealization of the world as a circular schematic where all of the resources can be effortlessly regenerated. It is important to look at debris, the waste of our own production processes, understand environmental and social problems in a visceral way via the raw ecologies of our bodies and the understandings that these problems are not just statistical and abstract. Environmental problems cannot simply be relayed and transposed to the management of resources via statistics. Rather, they're landed as Latour has suggested, on bodies, the water we drink, and the air that we breathe. So to begin exploring this landing, I will share a little video, which was displayed as a hologram at the Istanbul Design Biennial um, of 2016, which was curated by Mark Wigley and Beatrice Colomina. For this venue, I have assembled, curated five holograms of human subjects, which were displayed in plexiglass pyramids as hologram in the image below the cylinder. Visitors had to lie on the floor in cushions to see them. This video, particularly the video called Excrement Man, is one of five subject typologies extruded from historical events to a realm that lingers between reality and fiction. And here you see the video. So after this video, um, we can recall um, the theories of Hungarian psychoanalysts and Dora Ferenczi in the early 20th century, who argued, as is portrayed in the diagram on your screen, that shit and money exhibit two sides of the same coin. Shit is ejected from the body and eventually rejected by the psyche, whereas money is interjected by the body and accepted as a highly desired form. Nevertheless, both entities derive from the same prime matter in the process of serial transformations where shit assumes different material states and roles all the way to money. In this sense, materials, he argued, only exist in certain stages or face changes while they absorb qualities from their previous stages. So mud is shit deodorized, sand is mud dehydrated, Pe pebbles are sand hardened, and coins are pebbles unearthed. The affinity between money and shit, also between capital and excrement, has been a pervasive subject of historical investigation. Roman emperor, for example, Vespasian, invented the phrase pecunia non ole, money does not smell, to explain the taxation for the usage of public urinals in order to expurgate the dishonorable act of defecation. So from the experimental processes of the alchemists to Freud's anal sadistic phase in the individual psychosexual development, recycling shit to money 
is as much a subject of theoretical analysis as it is a factual constituent of capitalist production. Waste needs to go away. And this very process of purging, transporting, and carrying into oblivion all that is worthless is utterly profitable. As Ferenczi wrote poignantly, money is dehydrated filth made to shine. In recent history, the latest market bubbles grow from the exchange of carbon dioxide emissions between countries in compliance with the Kyoto Protocol. Future market bubbles are prognosticated to rise from the trading of urban waste. Congested metropolitan environments like New York City produce, for example, massive amounts of solid waste and sewage that is then transported out of the city. The purging of this waste is invisible to our perception, but it generates capital, immense amounts of capital for those who manage and transfer the raw materials. New York City, the beating heart of global finance and culture is home to more than 8.5 million people. And all of these create an enormous amount of excrement. As reporter Oliver Millman wrote in The Guardian, a substantial amount of the city's shit is expelled to Birmingham, Alabama, causing major stink methane clouds 900 miles away. The treated sewage, euphemistically known in the industry as biosolids, travels by this food train to a landfill west of Birmingham, Alabama, causing what the locals and the mayor's office call the death smell. Since the Environmental Protection Agency decided in 1988 that it was not a great idea to dump shit into the ocean, where to put New York's fecal matter has become a constant challenge because the city creates around 1,200 tons of sewage every single day. In Alabama, the avalanche of northern poo is part of a wider concern of the environmental risks for residents, particularly the impoverished and people of color. Further south, a landfill bordering the majority of African-American settlement of Uniontown contains around four meter tons of toxic coal ash and welcomes other debris from 33 states. The dismissal of the environmental concerns of Alabama residents, mostly residents of overwhelmingly African-American communities has been reported as a case of civil rights and environmental racism. Overall, and in many ways, shit forces us to look at questions of ecology in a visceral way via the raw ecologies of our bodies. And the understanding that, as I said before, excrement and waste is not just a statistical problem, but a bodily reality. As Donna Haraway recently wrote in her last book, Staying with the Trouble, I am a compostist, not a post-humanist. We are all compost, not post-human. Well, the displacement of this kind of material from New York to Alabama is highly curated. It transfers the problem to disenfranchised terrains. Therefore, the question of how to handle, retain, pile, decompose, and redistribute waste is more than a technical problem related to the trading of carbon emissions. It is also a matter of justice and equity. Retaining waste on site and designing the infrastructure on how we can manage to live with our own excrements and closed in, for example, anaerobic digesters is an opportunity that may have long-term environmental and health benefits, despite the upfront cost of investing in specialized digestive infrastructural machines. Indigenous cultures have long pioneered the management of waste without ignoring it or expelling it. In designing infrastructural machines that recycle waste to energy as inhabitable living spaces, the premise is that humans can coexist with the material consequences of their living processes. In the toilet and garden space that you see in the image, feces, for example, are separated from urine and digested in an integrated toilet garden slash social auditorium space. Human excrement becomes nutrients for soil and produces methane to power hydroponic and aquaponic garden. 
The toilet therefore becomes a central space for the life support system and the social dynamics and, and attitudes towards ablution spaces that would no doubt need to change in the future. Foreseeably, these kinds of possibilities could compel us to reinvent the politics of our territorial dimension. Similar to Sandor Ferenzi's psychoanalytical argument who argued that shit might equal money, the logic of regeneration and feedback has been instrumental in promoting sustainability and generating capital investments. The premise is that in addition to money, shit might equal food, as was argued in the famous book, Cradle to Cradle. It can generate methane, meaning power, if treated properly. In this logic, the life and metabolism of living creatures is and should be decoded, processed, and transposed to industrial systems advocating for a full circle of life with no loss. One must yet be aware, though, of the false, false sense of holism that this premise engenders and its delusion of fulfillment. A closed regenerative system insulates itself from receiving environmental input as well as from discharging output. Ultimately, it functions like an improvisatory sealed structure that regenerates new conditions out of what is available within its systemic borders. In a closed system, any modification occurs internally, affecting the organizational structure of the system alone. Oftentimes, these structures are unpredictable in their organization. Ecological systems are in many ways digestive machines, something like giant stomachs. And so they're sometimes disobedient. This is what autonomy, energy autonomy means in many ways. Even if we wish to portray ecosystems as robust and whole in the way that they circulate and recirculate matter in a way that waste might equal food, the idea of self-sufficiency is compulsive and hysteric in the will to ceaselessly generate new life from all wasteful cycles of production. Deviation and redundancy must then be confronted and enhanced, not marked as errors. Let us not forget that more than a material should also indicate a general state of incoherency, degeneration, and malevolence. It indicates a stage where information is so finely grained and scattered that it cannot form identifiable bonds. This general position asks architects to investigate the full spectrum of life in all its living systems, materials, and components as a complex interdwining of overlapping ecologies and the way that these kinds of ecology, ecologies unfold in space and in time. In this way, the notion of a spatial environment takes on a new role. Instead of it being the inactive, static, and historicized com context within which an architectural object may be placed, the environment quite literally becomes the object of design itself. And here I want to transfer on this idea of recycling, not just as a technical problem or a material problem, but also as an ideational apparatus that one may use in how, uh, that a researcher may use in how they generate research methods. And I have tentatively called the way that I'm conducting research for books, exhibitions, installations as the debris of, one owns, of one's own research. A lot of my work um, overall begins from the examination um, and the redesigning and the animation of archives. I see an archive not as a static object that contains historical documents, but more of an immersive space and a living collection where existential ideas about world orders migrate through different architectural and spatial typologies. Designing an archive is not only about curating and categorizing found objects as a kind of didactic act. It also enables journeys between different times, places, and objects of investigation. These journeys are spatial and temporal at the same time. They allow us to inhabit and digest spaces, stories, 
and locked secrets. When archival objects are reactivated, we're not quite sure whether they are from the past or the future. While working on the book that I have talked about a little bit, Closed Roles, or any other project for that matter, I am compelled to pursue different kinds of research, including historical archival surveys combined with technical reports, data management, and other investigations on alternative formats of representation, original drawings, lexicons, and databases. Diversification is absolutely critical to my work, not just in, as the analysis of each project's context, but also in the forms of dissemination and display. What did not make it into the main archive became a compilation of minor histories, which you see on uh, the screen, parallel to the archive. The words that could not be analyzed properly when analyzing a case study were assembled into a lexicon. The voices that could not be heard became parts of the encounters that never happened. In this way, a main line of investigation creates the debris along the way of its production, and the debris may be reconstituted into other means of representation, net zero diagrams, graphic elements for an exhibition, drawings, words, virtual reality environments, documentaries. Even the floor seating from a previous iteration traveling became, to, uh, became a component of an other exhibition incarnation. This modality of thinking and acting, of reviving the debris of one's own research, makes evident that in the history of ideas, discourses get recycled. Materials in closed roles are not the only items for recycling. Concepts may emerge as allegedly new, but ideas undergo long journeys of migration from one epistemological field to another. Contrary to a building, a drawing, or a book, an archive and a database is a distinctive disciplinary category of an architectural project that empowers new forms of authorship based on the extrusion of, extrusion of evidence to an event that lingers between reality and fiction. The cycling process of ideas, as in the case of reusing what I tentatively call the debris of your own research, is also a form of resistance to a project's linearity or causality to respond as a solution to particular named problems. Recycling becomes a disruption to idealized continuums or a productive distraction to the arrow of time. As the father of general systems theory, Heinz von Forster argued, it is favorable to have some noise in a system. If a system is going to freeze into a particular state, if it is inadaptable, it may be altogether wrong, incapable of adjusting itself to a more appropriate state. Because it is not just information that matters, but also noise. What appears as noise at one level of reference, at one scale, may become useful input in another level of reference. Such is the case in this line of work that I have shared with you. The surplus of means and mediums that become byproducts of other mediums constitutes an intentional view of the world which is out of focus. It reflects the conditions of the world as a heap of waste. A coagulation of ideas, bodies, platforms, objects, displaced from context and history. Our world of climate emergency, health crisis, and social inequity. Thank you so much. <laughs>